Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's get underway. Good afternoon to you all and uh, thank you for joining us both uh, online and uh, those who are um, here in the, the Parliamentary Theatre or the Parliament House Theatre. Welcome to this afternoon's symposium to mark the 100th, 120th anniversary of the Commonwealth Franchise Act. My name is Jonathan Curtis and I'm the head of the Parliamentary Library Research Branch. I'll begin by acknowledging the traditional Ngunnawal custodians of this land and their elders. I also acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples of the places you are joining us from, wherever that could be uh, online. Excuse me. 2022 is the 120th anniversary of two key pieces of legislation that underpin the practice of democracy in Australia, the Franchise and Electoral Acts. These acts were foundation stones in the construction of Australia's democracy. This alone makes them of interest. However, they also exemplify, I think, the importance of politics and the power of change over time. We're joined today, I'm very pleased to say, by some of Australia's most renowned political historians. Um, uh, these are names that I've uh, grown up reading uh, through my university career and post-grad work and so uh, in, in several cases it's um, fantastic to meet for the first time. Uh, our panel chair is Emeritus Professor Marion Saw, uh, Professor Marilyn Lake, next one along, and uh, Professor Tim Rouse and Dr Ben Jones. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Dr Diane Herriot, who's lurking up the back, uh, who's the parliamentary librarian and um, to whom the, um, the honour of thinking of this fantastic idea uh, belongs. So, um, as you know, the Parliamentary Library is co-hosting this event with the Australasian Study of Parliament group uh, in, for the ACT chapter. So I'm also pleased to acknowledge my colleague P Penny Dane, who is Sergeant at Arms, where is Penny? Oh, there you are, right in the front. Who, as well as being Sergeant at Arms in the House of Representatives, is the President of the ASPG ACT chapter. I hope you enjoy what promises to be a fascinating discussion. Uh, we will, uh, in a moment, I'll hand over to Marion and we will uh, run through the, uh, the three um, speakers uh, and then at the end we'll have time for a, a discussion. So, um, please welcome our panellists and I'll hand over to Marion. Thank you, Jonathan. And uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, let, me, let me start by acknowledging the, the Ngunnawal and Nyambri peoples, the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And let me congratulate the parliamentary librarian, librarian Diane Herriot, for uh, recognising the significance of this anniversary, the 120th anniversary of the Commonwealth Franchise Act and the Commonwealth Electoral Act. And uh, thank you Parliamentary Library and Jonathan for organising this outstanding panel of speakers uh, whom we're going to hear from uh, on themes relating to the anniversary. And uh, I'll start off with a few comments of my own on the anniversary. Australia is, has often been called the first nation to invent itself through the ballot box referring to the popular referenda that helped bring the new nation to being. A relatively democratic and peaceful beginning, unlike the birth of so many other countries. The new federal constitution also had some strikingly democratic features, such as the guarantee that there would be no plural votes for property in either house of the new federal parliament. This achievement was followed up by the pioneering act celebrated today. The Commonwealth Franchise Act enacted the most inclusive and equal franchise in the world at the time, despite the House of Representatives amendments taking away Aboriginal voting rights, something eventually accepted by the government as the price of passage. <clears throat> 
We'll hear more about that uh, from members of the panel today. But unlike the franchise in other countries, there was neither privileging of property nor disqualification of the propertyless. Under the Franchise Act, inmates of charitable institutions um, would have the right to vote, unlike the situation in uh, the States, um, where those resident in charitable institutions were disenfranchised. South Australia was an exception to that disenfranchisement of the poor, and the new Commonwealth Electoral Act and franchise provisions were largely based on South Australian uh, provisions, and so inmates of charitable institutions could vote in federal elections. The Commonwealth Franchise Act was also remarkable in pioneering the political rights of women, both to vote and to stand for parliament at the national level. So a huge expansion of the franchise with women coming in. Uh, we'll hear a, a lot more about what women did with that voting power from, from Marilyn Lake today. But we often have to remind our European colleagues that it was Australia that was the pioneer of those combined political rights for women, the right to vote and the right to stand for parliament, because many of our European colleagues are convinced that it was Finland that led the way. Not so. But of course, Finland did follow up uh, granting these political rights by actually electing 19 women in 1907, whereas here we had to wait until 1943. The uh, Commonwealth Electoral Act, which I'll say a little bit about because the, the emphasis of the panellists is going to be on the Commonwealth Franchise Act, so I'll just say a few words about the Commonwealth Electoral Act um, of October 1902. It was a pioneering piece of legislation providing for Commonwealth electoral machinery separate from the, that of the states and enabling uniform electoral administration through a structure of divisional returning offices, that basic structure we still have today in 2022. The uh, Commonwealth Electoral Act enshrined the legacy of William Boothby the concept of salaried and independent electoral administrators distanced from partisanship and not amateurs, professionals. Uh, this electoral administrator, which uh, was the concept at the centre of the Electoral Act, was someone who took professional pride in ensuring an accurate and comprehensive electoral role and the most uh, complete recording of the opinions of all Australians. The Boothby legacy meant putting the onus on the state rather than on the individual citizen to ensure a comprehensive role. So following the passage of the Electoral Act came the epic compilation in 1902-03 of the new Commonwealth electoral role state police mounted on horseback as well as foot constables travelled to all corners of the continent and they entered up almost two million names on the new Commonwealth electoral roll, some 96% of the adult population. This was undoubtedly the most comprehensive enrolment of any nation up to that time for the purposes of democracy. The professionalism of the new Commonwealth electoral offices was demonstrated at their first conference in 1904, where they committed themselves to eradicating some uh, minor problems in the role in two of the states, some anomalies. So they were onto it 
They were going to get that role accurate and comp as well as comprehensive, despite the fact that eliminating the anomalies meant that there would be a slight reduction from that magic, that magic figure of 96% of the adult population enrolled to vote. So now I'm going to introduce the first of our speakers, Professor Marilyn Lake, the preeminent scholar of women's political history in Australia. Marilyn is the author or co-author of many influential books, such as the multi-award winning Drawing the Global Colour Line of 2008, but today it's the, her path-breaking book, Getting Equal, which provides the backdrop for her presentation on the Franchi Franchise Act. So please welcome Marilyn. Thank you very much, Marion, and thank you for that really interesting introduction. I'd like to pay my respects to the local traditional owners past and present. I'd like to thank Jonathan for um, setting up this panel, as far as I knew, and inviting me to speak on it, and to thank my um, fellow panellists for being here, and to thank all of you. So my topic today is the Commonwealth Franchise Act of 1902 and its, top, its um, subtitle is She Votes in Australia. The act to provide for a uniform federal franchise was complicated in its provisions. It accorded white women the same political rights as white men. It disqualified Indigenous Australians, Asian people, African people and Pacific Islanders except New Zealand Maori. Citizenship in Australia, as in most other countries at the time, was a racialised condition, which also had implications for the kind of welfare state Australians would implement. The Act also disqualified anyone convicted of treason. Some people under sentence or awaiting sentence were disqualified. People of unsound mind were disqualified, and which made me wonder how did they uh, decide um, who was of unsound mind. Um, Marion probably can tell us more about that. My focus today is on the world historic change that occurred when Australian women were accorded universal political rights, allowed to vote and stand for election to the national parliament on the same basis as men. A change that had profound domestic and international significance. According to the contemporary historian Ida Husted Harper, the historian, she was the historian of the US, um, the US women's movement that famously dated back to Seneca Falls in 1848, Australian women's enfranchisement, she noted, was the most important event in the history of the world movement toward women's suffrage. The legislation was passed by men, necessarily, but it led to what one Australian suffragist called a new element being introduced into political life. As I explained in my History of Feminism in Australia, Getting Equal, published a long time ago now in 1999, suffragists expected that women's votes would make a difference to gender relations in Australia and the society more broadly. Rose Scott, one of the leaders of the New South Wales movement, looked forward to the advent of what she called, quote, a mother woman's world with loving heart and sheltering arms. A world in which women and children would be protected by sheltering arms from men's violence. A world in which women would enjoy economic independence and thus be better able to defend themselves and their children from abuse and violence and exploitation. In 1903, Scott gave a public lecture on, quote, the economic, on economic independence and the married woman. Feminists believed that the work of motherhood should be paid by the state. This was the era of state socialism. Rose Scott believed in universal suffrage rights Campaigning for womanhood suffrage in New South Wales, she'd argued against racial exclusions, defending the enfranchisement of Aboriginal Australians on human rights grounds. She said, they are human beings with an interest in their country and its laws, and on this same principle, is there any logical reason for depriving the women of the country of the same privilege? 
The accident of race or colour, she said, cannot interfere with the principle involved in one man, one vote and the right of the people to govern themselves. According to Scott, quote, self-government was a basic human right. The sex of a human being, she said, was, like race or colour, a secondary matter. Similarly, Vida Goldstein in Victoria denounced the racial exclusions of the Maternity Allowance Act. She wrote, it is the white Australia policy gone mad. Maternity is maternity, whatever the race. The rights of mothers, in other words, were universal. This emphasis on the common status of motherhood in Ada Bromham's felicitous phrase would be the distinctive message of post-suffrage non-party feminists as expressed by the Women's Political Association in Victoria, the Victorian Women's Citizens Movement, the Women's Services Guild in Western Australia, the United Associations in New South Wales, and the first national body, the Australian Federation of Women Voters. It would also be the message that brought feminists together across the settler colonial world, especially across the Pacific, as we shall see. Although much emphasis today is placed on Vida Goldstein's career ambitions, her candidacy, that is, along with two other women often forgotten, for election to the Federal Cup Parliament in 1903 and four times thereafter, it was not political careers for individual women that was the founding feminist's main goal. That would have seemed to them a very limited and self-serving goal. Women, they believed, shared a distinctive perspective born of distinctive experience that should shape, the collect, should shape collective care in the Commonwealth. They hoped to realise their vision of a mother woman's world with loving heart and sheltering arms. It was the protection of women and, ch and girls and a transformation in relations between men and women that they desired. To this end, all post-suffrage organisations sought and mostly achieved the appointment of women to all public offices so that vulnerable women need never fall into men's hands. The appointment of women as doctors, as prison warders, as magistrates, as factory inspectors and as police. Rose Scott's Political and Education League listed the following measures as those they wish to see implemented, and this will give you an idea. She listed the Girls' Protection Bill, the Family Maintenance Act, registration of nurses, the, the hours of hospital nurses to be limited, interesting, equal pay for equal work, equal ownership and guardianship of children by both parents, the economic independence of married women, again, and the appointment, she said, of women sanitary inspectors, boarding out inspectors, school inspectors and truant officers. Australia's founding feminists were nation builders, engaged at the beginning of a new century in forging a new kind of welfare state. In no other part of the world, as far as one can ascertain, said Labor leader Lillian Locke Burns, is so much being done by the state in the way of providing for mothers and children, as in the Australian Commonwealth. She had in mind state boarding out payments that enabled single mothers to care for their children at home, age of consent legislation, and the Labor government's maternity allowance, which was not a baby bonus, in quotes, as its conservative detractors called it, but what they called a mother citizen's right. Lillian Lockburns continued, and yet how far we are still from a proper realisation of the value of the child as an asset of the state, and how little we realise the true position of the mothers of the community, the true position they would occupy in a properly organised social system, where the economic independence of women, again, was fully recognised and assured. Bessie Rishbeef, the inaugural president of the first national women's organisation, the Australian Federation of Women Voters, agreed, stating she hoped to mobilise, quote, an army of Australian women, organised thus to make the vote more effective by helping to establish a human basis of welfare. Working together, she said, women could create new channels whereby human welfare shall play the first and great part in our social system.
They wanted, in other words, and as they often said, a welfare state and not a warfare state. In the year in which the Commonwealth franchise was passed, Vladi Goldstein was appointed the Australasian delegate to the first International Woman Suffrage Conference, which was held in the United States in the capital, Washington, DC, where she was greeted enthusiastically by other participants as a youthful pioneer, she was 32, from a progressive land. After the conference, Goldstein embarked on an extensive speaking tour, north up the East Coast to New York and Boston, and then across the continent, all the while promoting Australia's example in extending political rights to women. When she arrived in New York, where she was hosted by the formidable Carrie Chapman Catt, she found a reporter and photographer waiting for her. She was unimpressed by the journalist's ignorance and insisted, America can teach us a whole lot, but we feel we can show some things to you that you would profit by adopting, and one of these is women's suffrage. In the United States, Goldstein realised that although American women had not yet achieved political rights, the great women's movement, in its very longevity, had itself become an object of national veneration and commemoration. This really, really um, you know, struck her, that the women's movement itself had become an object of national veneration, already producing its own mythologies, its celebrity leaders, and a multi-volume history already. The lack of historical commemoration of the Australian suffrage movement and its leaders became an increasingly painful source of disappointment for Goldstein, who chose to leave her papers to the Fawcett Library in London. Others in Australia, such as Bessie Rishbeth and Jessie Street, put their rich collections of papers into the National Library in the hope that, as a result, they and the movements they fostered couldn't be written out of Australian political history. In Boston in 1902, Goldstein met more of the American suffrage leaders. She addressed six different women's groups in that city, which was quite um, usual for her tour to various cities. In Boston, including the Equal Suffrage Association for Good Government, or BSAG, warming to her theme of how woman suffrage led to better government, a more moral community, and the purification of politics. The secretary of this group was young Maud Wood Park, a lobbyist for womanhood suffrage at the national level in the United States. And interestingly, her papers would form the basis of the famous Schlesinger Library Women's History Collection at Radcliffe College at Harvard. Goldstein and Park became good friends. In 1909, Park responded to Goldstein's invitation and embarked on a research trip to Australia, accompanied by her friend Mabel Willard, she'd just divorced, to find out what Australian women had done with the vote. This was the question. And their preferred political strategies, an investigation that has gone unmentioned in most Australian political history, but is documented at length in my most recent book, called Progressive New World. Park wrote a long essay detailing her experiences in Australia, meeting Australian feminists and other political leaders, including Andrew Fisher, in Melbourne and Sydney. And it's a really valuable and very long historical document for the perspective on Australian political history. Um, and the only copy I know of can be found in the Schlesinger Library. Goldstein's friendship with Maud Wood Park offers important insight into the trans-Pacific dynamics of the suffrage movement. And you can also trace these connections in the careers, for example, of Alice Henry and Miles Franklin in their work at the National Women's Trade Union League in Chicago. Park's essay also informs us about the development of post-suffrage non-party feminist strategy. <laughs> The question is often asked, wrote Park in this essay, after woman suffrage, what? Sometimes the asker means what methods of organisation will women employ? Sometimes what ends will they seek? Sometimes what results will they obtain? These were the research questions that led to her research trip. At a time when American suffragists were still campaigning for the vote, Australian women citizens were theorising the meaning of women's citizenship in Australia, which is very interesting, I think. 
and a couple of the meanings that were prominent for them was it meant it should mean economic independence for citizens and the inviolability of women's bodies. And they were experimenting with the possibilities and potential of women's political power to shape the public domain. In Melbourne and Sydney, Park and Willard interviewed the leaders of the new post-suffrage political organisations and reported on their aims and strategies. So to cut a very long story short, which I now must, they concluded in the end that they had gained a pretty definite idea of what women wanted, which is again interesting. They noted that despite class and political differences, the similarities in women's platforms were such as to give, to quote her, a pretty definite idea of what women's causes were. On all sides, they agreed on the importance of protecting women and children, maternity and infancy. And the preferred political strategy of most post-suffrage feminists was to avoid the major parties and support independent woman candidates, such as Goldstein. When Park returned to the United States, she led the suffrage lobbying effort in DC, which was documented in her book called Front Door Lobbyists. And once victorious, she and her feminist co-workers formed the new organisation called the National League of Women Voters, of which Park became the inaugural president to promote women's causes as the trans-Pacific women's movement understood them. The first legislation for which the National League of Women Voters claimed credit in the United States was the Shepherd Towner Maternity and Infancy Act, passed in 1920, the first major American legislation relating to women following their enfranchisement, and an expression of the maternalist politics of child protection accorded priority by the post-suffrage trans-Pacific women's movement. In conclusion, in Australia, the Maternity Allowance Act had been passed eight years earlier, in 1912, enacted by the Fisher Labor government in response to lobbying by organised labour women, who congratulated the Prime Minister on, quote, his noble and wise act, in, quote, conferring this instalment of mother's maternal rights. The political language had shifted post-suffrage from the need for protection to the demand for citizen rights. This shift in understanding had been encouraged by the enfranchisement of women. In her report on her Australian visit just one year before the election of the Fisher government, they were here in 1909, Fisher the government elected in 1910, interestingly, and as I said, they'd met, um, Park had noted in particular, quote, women's equal standing in the industrial and political organisation of the Labor Party. She further suggested that because the Labor Party had adopted many women's objectives, women's aims, she thought, would soon be achieved in Australia. The Labor Party was voted into office in 1910 and many attributed its victory to the women's vote. One headline in a US newspaper, for example, noted, she votes in Australia. Or as Harper's Weekly observed, not altogether sympathetically, Australia had fallen under, quote, the domination of the working man and the voting woman. Soon Australians would be at war, 1914, when alone among combatant nations, Australia voted twice to reject the introduction of conscription for overseas service. Alarmed at the likely impact of women voters on the outcome, Prime Minister Hughes had issued during his Yes campaign, during that campaign he had issued a special pamphlet addressed specifically to women voters warning them that their citizenship was on trial, but to no avail. In 1916 and 1917, a majority of Australians voted no. Thank you. So, next to introduce Professor Tim Rouse, who's really a, a kind of renaissance man. He, he spans the disciplines of history, politics, sociology, and anthropology. He's the author of much acclaimed books, including Indigenous and Other Australians Since 1901. And uh, he uh, is the recipient of a centenary medal for his contributions to Australian studies and to uh, indigenous studies, well deserved. But today he'll be grappling with some of the most important issues relating to the voice uh, to Parliament. Please welcome Tim. <laughs> 
No, it's not on the screen. Oh, there it is. Good. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon. The idea that Indigenous Australians can be and should be voters is once again, in 2022, up for discussion. Of course, no one would dare challenge the long-achieved reality that Indigenous Australians have the right and the obligation to vote for federal, state and territory legislators. What is now under discussion is whether the members of the Indigenous Voice to Parliament should be directly elected by an enrolled Indigenous electorate or chosen in some other way. The final report of the co-design process, which I'll refer to as the Kalmar Langton Report after its major authors, Professor, Professors Tom Kalmar and Marcia Langton, found a widespread view that members of the national voice should not be directly elected. Many of those consulted in the co-design process preferred that the members of the national voice should be chosen by the 35 proposed local and regional Indigenous voices. And the local and regional voices themselves will not necessarily be chosen by direct election by enrolled Indigenous voters. Rather, in the model proposed by Kalmar and Langton, the constitutions of each of the local and regional voices will be in accordance with the Indigenous political traditions of each region. In short, the Kalmar Langton Report, the only blueprint of the Indigenous voice that has yet been made public, warned us not to assume that the voice would be chosen by an Indigenous electorate. Among the reasons for this warning were three that I'll highlight today. Firstly, there are ongoing disputes about who is Indigenous and thus about who would be entitled in, to vote in, this, uh, in, in that system. Secondly, there is a persistent tendency amongst Indigenous Australians of under-enrolment to vote. And thirdly, there is a persistent pattern of low turnout amongst Indigenous Australians who are enrolled to vote. This was evident in the elections conducted by ATSIC. In combination, these three problems associated with direct election of the national voice would have a tendency to weaken the legitimacy of the Indigenous voice. Kalmar and Langton recommend that the members of the national voice be selected, not elected, selected by local and regional voices. Now, I've started my talk today by considering the Kalmar Langton report as an exercise in Indigenous Australian political thought. All political thought profits from the consideration of history's experiments in institutional design. The idea that Indigenous Australians can and should be voters in elections is one such experiment. Let me remind you of the following steps in that experiment. In 1902, the Commonwealth Franchise Act excluded from the federal franchise persons classified by a state as Aboriginal and forbidden from voting in that state's elections. This meant that Aboriginal people in Western Australia, Queensland, and after 1911, the Northern Territory, could not vote in elections administered by a state or by the Commonwealth. In 1949, the Commonwealth amended the Act to allow an Aboriginal person to vote if he or she was then or had ever been a member of the Defence Force. In 1961, the Commonwealth Parliament appointed a select committee to consider extending the right to vote to the estimated 30,000 adults in Western Australia, Queensland and the Northern Territory who were excluded from enrolling to vote in federal elections because they were deemed Aboriginal. The Select Committee recommended that these Indigenous Australians be allowed to enrol, to enrol to vote, but that they not be compelled to enrol. In 1962, the Commonwealth legislated what the Select Committee had recommended, and Western Australia amended its uh, electoral laws similarly in, this, in that year. In 1964, in the Northern Territory, people classified as wards, which was almost entirely Aboriginal people, were entitled to vote, but they were voting for an assembly with only advisory powers until the Commonwealth gave self-government to the Northern Territory in 1978. In 1965, Queensland amended its electoral laws to enfranchise all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander adults, but it made enrolment optional and it made it an offence to persuade such persons to enrol. In 
We should note the decision to make it optional for Indigenous Australians to enrol to vote. This departed from an, an Australian citizenship ideal that all enfranchised persons have a duty to vote. Voting in federal elections had been compulsory since 1924, and by 1941 all states had made voting compulsory. So why were Indigenous Australians given the option not to enrol and thus not to vote? In the early 1960s, some Aboriginal people in remote regions had had so little exposure to non-Indigenous institutions that it would have been futile to compel them to exercise any right of citizenship. As well, the Select Committee hearings and other ethnographic research in the 1950s had found evidence of Aboriginal ambivalence about voting. So as well as recognising and upholding Indigenous Australians' right to vote, Australian governments have had to cultivate Indigenous Australians' ability and willingness to exercise that right. In 1979, the Fraser government initiated an Aboriginal electoral education program in the remote north and centre of Australia. In 1983, the Commonwealth made it compulsory for Indigenous Australians to enrol uh, as voters and to vote. This standardisation of the obligation to vote led to further educational efforts by the national government, the Aboriginal Electoral Information Service, commencing in 1986 and directed to all Indigenous Australians. At the same time as Australian governments were introducing Indigenous Australians to the mainstream voting system by these changes in laws and by educational programs uh, that I've just reviewed, Governments were also experimenting with parallel Indigenous representative institutions that gave Indigenous Australians an opportunity to vote. And these parallel institutions were the National Indigenous, sorry, I should say National Indigenous Consultative Committee, uh, which had 41 members, the Nash, followed by the National Aboriginal Conference, which had 36 members, and then from 1989 to 2005, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission, which had 60 regions initially, reduced to 36 regions in 1993. These bodies differed in structure and powers. The NAC and the NAC were like parliaments, composed of members elected from single member electorates. The NAC and the NAC had no programs. They simply advised. ATSIC was made up of regional councils to which members were elected by voters in each region. ATSIC was both an advisory body and responsible for administering certain programs. All three bodies shared the characteristic that each was made up of members who identified as Indigenous and who were elected by voters who identified as Indigenous. It was not compulsory for Indigenous Australians to vote in NAC, NAC or ATSIC elections. The Australian Electoral Commission did not create a distinct Indigenous electoral role. Because there was no Indigenous electoral role, we can't know precisely what proportion of Indigenous persons entitled to vote for these three parallel representative institutions did actually vote. However, a 1994 sample survey of Indigenous Australians, the National Aboriginal and Islander Survey, or NATSIS, found that 39.4% of Indigenous adults, roughly two out of every five, had voted in the 1993 ATSIC elections. A later study used census data and came up with a lower figure for voter turnout in ATSIC elections. Voters were 23 to 24% of the Indigenous population of voting age in the ATSIC elections of 1993, 1996 and 1999. ATSIC's fourth election was in October 2002. The then chair of ATSIC, Jeff Clark, said that he respected Indigenous Australians' choice not to vote, but he urged them to vote. 
He was worried that continuing low voter turnout damaged ATSIC's claim to be representative of all Indigenous Australians. Within two years, both Labor and the Coalition agreed that ATSIC should be terminated. Such anxiety about ATSIC's legitimacy has been carried forward to the present day. The report by Professors Kalmer and Langton discusses the, text, the tests of legitimacy that the Indigenous voice might have to face. If and when the Australian Parliament legislates the Indigenous voice, it should consider carefully the results of Australia's experiments in, in improving the representation of Indigenous Australians in politics. I suggest that we draw the following contrast. On the one hand, most Indigenous Australians who are entitled to vote do vote in elections for the national, state and territory legislatures. On the other hand, most Indigenous Australians who are entitled to vote have not voted in elections conducted by special Indigenous-only representative institutions. We should not conclude from this that Indigenous Australians um, do value the mainstream legislatures and do not value the Indigenous-only representative institutions. Voting is not the only meaningful form of political participation. Recent political activity by Indigenous Australians has demonstrated how committed they are to increasing their influence in Australia's politics. Here I refer to the series of 12, Nash, 12 First Nations regional dialogues in 2016 and 2017 that culminated in the National Indigenous Assembly at Uluru in May 2017. That admirable, admirable Indigenous political process was a further Indigenous experiment in political representation. Let's remember how those assemblies were constituted. Unlike the NAACC, the NAC and ATSIC, the membership of the, these assemblies was not determined by voting, but by consultations among Indigenous organisations within each region. These consultations would, were guided by the following formula. 60% of each assembly had to come from First Nations slash traditional owner groups, 20% of the delegates were from community organisations, and 20% were what is called key individuals. The designers of these Indigenous assemblies also drew on the non-Indigenous heritage of political representation. As the Referendum Council report explains, the assemblies were, quote, modelled partly on the constitutional centenary foundation framework utilised throughout the 1990s to encourage debate on constitutional issues in local communities and schools. The result was a deliberative process involving, quote, 1,200 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander delegates, an average of 100 delegates from each dialogue out of a population of approximately 600,000 people nationally. And the Referendum Council goes on to make the following claim. This is the most proportionally significant consultation process that has ever been undertaken with First Peoples. Indeed, it engaged a greater proportion of the relevant population than the constitutional convention debates of the 1800s from which First Peoples were excluded. In short, if we care to notice it, Indigenous Australians have recently been conducting a further experiment in democratic process. And they may well be teaching the rest of us <coughs> a lesson in democracy. One of those lessons is that voting is not the only way that Indigenous Australians wish to choose their representatives. In conclusion, we're right to celebrate the 60th anniversary of opening the Commonwealth voting process to Indigenous Australians. But it is certainly in all our interests to value and, and defend, and, and, rather, and it is certainly in all our interests to value and defend the voting system that we have. But let us not make the mistake of thinking that voting is the only democratic way to choose representatives. When the Australian Parliament sits down to design and legislate an Indigenous voice, it must bear in mind the very recent heritage of Indigenous experiments in democratic process. The final report of the Indigenous Voice co-design process draws on this heritage. <clears throat>
that is the Karma Langton Report. And it invites us to consider options beyond the conventional idea of Indigenous voters directly electing the members of the national voice. We should take note. So next will come Dr. to Ben Jones, a, who's a prolific author and researcher on Australia's political history, particularly Australian republicanism. As well as holding posts at a number of Australian universities, he has worked as an historian at the Museum of Australian Democracy. His, his books include This Time, Australia's Republican Past and Future, a subject on which he's been much engaged, I have to say. Uh, but today he's going to be talking about expanding the polis, the secret ballot and the Franchise Act. Please welcome Ben. Good afternoon, colleagues. It's a great pleasure for me to speak with you here on beautiful Ngunnawal country and uh, to share a panel with three distinguished academics who I respect enormously and have learned a great deal from over the years and continue to do so today. I was a bit daunted, however, when I received the invitation about exactly what I can add to this discussion as the two most prominent features of the 1902 Franchise Act uh, that it was an enormous expansion of the electorate, but even as it functioned to include women, it said uh, corollary was to exclude First Nations. And when I saw the blurbs that uh, Professor Lake would be talking about female suffrage and Professor Rouse on Indigenous voting, and I certainly defer to both on those topics. So what I'd like to do with my time is link this, the 120th anniversary of the Franchise Act, to another piece of legislation uh, celebrating its 150th anniversary this year, which is the UK's Ballot Act of 1872. And what I'd like to suggest is that the Secret Ballot and the Franchise Act are connected in two ways. Firstly, because the Secret Ballot was seen as a way of civilising elections and stamping out the violence that was synonymous with open or viva voca voting in the 19th century. And this in turn, at a time when even many advocates for women's suffrage accepted gender binaries and the concept of men's and women's spheres, was crucial in reimagining elections as an event where men and women could take part. And the second link is that both were the result of a transnational network of ideas, particularly but not exclusively in the English-speaking world, and that while Australia put both secret voting and white female suffrage in place decades before the UK, they were not so much national achievements as progressive thinkers finding fertile soil in Australia for democratic experiments that could then be used as an example for Britain, the United States and the world. And uh, this image is from a 1911 booklet with an international and particularly a British audience in mind. And it proudly notes that part of the uh, kindness of Australia is that uh, there is suffrage for the adult rather than suffrage uh, for the man. So there certainly was an element of national pride that Australia was the second country to grant women the vote and the first to allow the right to stand for parliament. And this was perhaps enhanced because the campaign ran concurrently with the campaign for federation and the nationalist sentiment that accompanied it. But the intellectual tradition that Australian campaigners drew on certainly had roots in the British world. And uh, as Professor Lake uh, demonstrates convincingly in Progressive New World, there was a vibrant exchange of ideas, tactics, uh, and indeed people with the United States. Concerns and criticisms of British elections go back a long way. Uh, the painting uh, on this slide is from a four-part series of William Hogarth oils, uh, finished in 1755, simply titled An Election. Uh, 
and uh, they're on display at the Sir John Soane Museum in London. If, uh, definitely worth seeing if you're in that part of the world. But a stinging critique of British elections, uh, Hogarth depicts them as uh, corrupt, violent, inebriated affairs. And uh, in this uh, particular painting, I'm not sure how well you can see it, but the infirmed, the insane, and even the dead are being brought forth to vote, uh, while a symbolic coach representing Britannia is falling apart in the background, not a subtle metaphor. And this contrasts sharply with the second image, which is from Melbourne. Uh, it's actually from a Victorian election in 1880, but it's a good visual of the key features of the Australian version of secret voting, which was introduced in Victoria in 1856. Secret voting certainly didn't begin in Australia. It goes back at least to ancient Athens. But the Australian version of secret voting had two distinct features, which today are ubiquitous in the democratic world. First, that the government would provide an official ballot, and second, that some kind of private compartment uh, would be provided for the voter. And these innovations were credited with severely limiting, if not ending, the practice of uh, treating, where voters would be bribed with alcohol to vote a certain way, as well as coercion from employers or from violent mobs when a voter's intentions uh, were made public. And uh, the, the poet Les Murray has a really interesting uh, poem on the secret ballot and uh, ends by saying that the polling booth will be a closet of prayer. And that, that's quite appropriate imagery as many of the advocates of secret voting uh, spoke almost in religious terms of the sacredness of the vote. After its introduction in Victoria, one Irish observer contrasted with Britain. There he said an elector would run a desperate gauntlet through corruption, drunkenness, violence and uproar. Whereas here, a voter walks through a smooth private avenue. So these two innovations, today generally taken for granted, are what differentiated the Australian version of secret voting. And this is the version pioneered in Victoria in 1856, hence rising to international fame as the Victorian or the Australian ballot. Uh, there are records in the US of it being called kangaroo voting, which I think is cute. Um, and. Uh, after some fabulous scholarship from Terry Newman, we now know Tasmania also introduced it in 1856, South Australia in 56, but didn't have a secret ballot election till the following year. New South Wales in 58, and Queensland had it in place from the start in 59. So why was the development of the Australian ballot significant for the passage of the Franchise Act nearly half a century later? Well, first, it changed the way elections were imagined. In the UK, the Liberal MP for Bristol, Francis Barclay, uh, took up the cause with incredible persistence and put it forward every year from 1847 to 1867. And the language his opponents almost always used was that secret voting is unmanly. There was a palpable gendered dimension to the idealised Protestant English gentleman as someone who openly states who he supports, and there was sometimes a sectarian element too with the private voting booth being unfavourably compared to a Catholic confessional. After the success, however, of the secret ballot in Australia, attitudes began to shift across the political divide. And although it was Gladstone's Liberal government that brought it in, in 1872, it needed support from Conservatives. And in a significant Select Committee support, uh, report, the Tasmanian Governor, Charles Duquesne, who had been the Tory MP for North Essex and consistently voted against Barclay's bill, changed his mind based on his experience in Australia and suggested that the ballot had transformed occasions of drunken violence to, quote, perfect order and tranquility. Or uh, to use our uh, chair, uh, Professor Saw's term, uh, they went from being free beer to a family festival. And that sums it up nicely, uh, Mary. Uh, 
Both the secret ballot and Australia's suffrage movement have long roots in the Enlightenment and have links to the British radical tradition. Uh, Jeremy Bentham, the intellectual leader of the philosophical radicals, was a strong supporter of both. So too uh, James Mill uh, and his famous son John Stuart Mill uh, was an outspoken uh, supporter of women's rights. Following the wide extension of the franchise after the Reform Act of 1832, there were calls to let women vote. Um, uh, rather, there were so many calls for women to vote that Parliament for the first time started using the term male persons to specifically exclude women. And this led to the first petition to Parliament for women's suffrage presented by the radical MP Henry Hunt on behalf of Yorkshire woman Mary Smith and other women who met the property qualification to vote but were nonetheless uh, denied that right. And uh, the postcard there on the slide is actually from 1908 and it depicts the Peterloo uh, massacre where Hunt had played a prominent role arguing for parliamentary reform. And so the implication in 1908 is that British women were still in the same struggle some 90 years later. And incidentally, also in 1908, that magnificent uh, suffragette uh, banner, which is just out the doors, uh, trust the uh, women mother if I have done. Uh, so if you haven't uh, seen it, just up there about the second left, it's, it's worth taking a moment to really, uh, to really contemplate uh, on its significance. And uh, finally, it's significant that the Chartist movement of the 1840s included women and initially called for universal suffrage along with the secret ballot and other demands but ultimately changed to just calling for male suffrage as a calculated political decision but certainly many Chartists supported both and in turn influenced debates in Australia. And it certainly wasn't a one-way street either, uh, with radical ideas going from Australia uh, back to influence the metropole, and nor was it a mere two-way street between Australia uh, and the mother country either. There was an active exchange of radical ideas and intellectual material throughout the English-speaking world and beyond. As uh, Audrey Oldfield writes, ideas moved freely between America and Britain and the yeast of feminist thought was fermenting in British intellectual society. In Australia, the Secret Ballot and the Franchise Act were attempts at expanding the polis and allowing more citizens to take part in public life. But this was accompanied uh, by a drive to explicitly exclude First Nations people. In uh, 1900, Vida Goldstein used her popular journal, The Australian Women's Sphere, to argue for women's uh, votes at the federal level. And this had already been achieved in South Australia and Western Australia. And the assumption was that the federal vote would oblige the other four states to follow suit. The October uh, issue included a racist uh, cartoon titled uh, Voters and uh, Voteless. And the image is very much aimed at the male lawmakers who would eventually draft the Franchise Act. It depicts uh, various men who all had the vote, a drunk, a drug addict, a wife beater, uh, the homeless, the ignorant, uh, but also these crude racial caricatures of a, a Chinese man with an opium pipe and a shirtless, shoeless Aboriginal man holding a boomerang and a bottle of alcohol. And uh, these men are contrasted with the educated young white woman in the middle, book in hand, stating, uh, but I may not be trusted with the vote. And there is some parallel, perhaps, with the way the Chartist dropped women's suffrage from their agenda for fear it would jeopardise their other goals and Australian campaigners for women's suffrage seeking to assure the public that they did not intend to include First Nations uh, men and women. Uh, the women's movement had some supporters, but were ultimately unable to get the franchise included in the constitution. So the next goal was to have men elected who are sympathetic to their cause and likely to pass a bill giving them the vote. But a particular concern was that if voting rights were simply given to all adult uh, British subjects, then that would include First Nations. Even supporters of women's suffrage, like uh, William Lyons, stressed in Parliament that the wording must, uh, and I quote, prevent the franchise being given to a number of Aborigines 
who are not, to say the least of it, of the highest intelligence. And there was particular opposition to First Nations uh, getting the vote in Queensland and Western Australia uh, in particular, which had the highest populations. And as Oldfield notes, uh, there was also a sexist as well as racist dimension to the prospect of First Nations women voting seemed to particularly terrify the First Parliament. And if you read through uh, the debates on the Commonwealth Franchise Bill, it's uh, littered with gendered and uh, racial slurs. The result, of course, was a special qualification, uh, disqualification for Aboriginal natives of Australia. Passing the Franchise Act was part of the struggle. The next step was proving the doubters wrong at an election and showing that the sky would not fall in. In the lead up to the second federal election, Goldstein highlights the importance of the secret vote. She wrote in 1903, we should do our utmost to make the woman's vote a power for good. We should earnestly entreat all women to keep clear for the present from party politics to avoid all political organisations and machines uh, offered and managed solely by men and to preserve as far as possible the secrecy of the ballot. The more ignorant men are as to how our votes will be cast, the more chance there is that we can secure pledge support for just measures and in the interest not only of women and children, but of the whole community, and uh, has a wonderful ending phrase, as we vote, so shall we reap, which is uh, still true today, I'd suggest. Early advocates for secret voting thought it was needed to stop employers from coercing workers, and later conservative supporters thought it was needed to stop powerful trade unions from pushing a certain agenda. But in the aftermath of the Franchise Act, uh, it, it was also seen as a benefit to women to keep their voting intentions secret from male-dominated political parties. In Tasmania, Queensland and Victoria, women got the vote after the Franchise Act. So the 1903 election was an important experiment of sorts. Just as the successful implementation of secret voting assuaged many uh, fears in Britain about its implementation, the success of the 1903 election in Australia was a powerful tool uh, for British suffragettes. There was an expectation in England that the Australian experiment uh, would produce radical results. As the Spectator noted in 1903, uh, women's suffrage must undoubtedly have played a large part. At the time of the creation of the Australian Commonwealth, it was noted by many observers that the federal parliament would in all likelihood prove more radical than any state government. And uh, while the nascent Labor Party did see some significant gains, uh, the election result was hardly a radical parliament. And as Claire Wright, uh, James Keating, Marilyn Lake and others have noted, Australian campaigners then took an active role in the movement in the UK, in the United States and elsewhere. In 1902, uh, Vida Goldstein attended the International Women's uh, Suffrage Conference uh, in Washington, as, as we've already heard, and had a rather surreal experience of leaving before the Franchise Act had passed and returning after it was in place. And she reflected on what it meant to be enfranchised and wrote an open letter to her American sisters that again highlights the transnational character of the movement. The open exchange of ideas and the degree to which the Franchise Act really is a shared achievement. And again, I think there is a precedent in secret voting which was quickly passed in the Australian colonies then adopted in rapid succession in New Zealand in 1870, the UK in 1872, Canada in 74, and then most of the United States throughout the 1880s and 90s. And it seems clear that Goldstein and other Australian campaigners were both motivated by their own success and conscious of the debt of gratitude, uh, the intellectual debt of gratitude they owed to campaigners in various parts of the English speaking world. Uh, so I'll give the final word uh, to Vida. Uh, she wrote, because we women in the land of the Southern Cross are reaping what England and America have sown, we are all the more eager to help our English sisters and American cousins in their struggle for freedom. Thank you. Okay, well, 
I get to ask a question of each of the uh, speakers first before we throw it open to uh, general Q&A. Um, so I'm going to start with, with um, Marilyn's presentation. She told us about how the suffragists believed in the power of the vote and how Australian suffragists operationalised that belief once, once they had the vote and how they contributed to the evolution of the welfare state. So that focus on policy remained true of Australian and international women's movements for many decades. Why does Marilyn think the emphasis changed in the 1990s when the presence of women in parliament became a priority issue on international agendas and indeed an indicator of the quality of democracy. Why the shift of emphasis on women in politics rather than women's voting power? Take it from there. <laughs> from up here. I'll take this back off again. That is the great question. One of the is this, is that okay? Well, one of the things I started thinking about a lot, I've worked on this material that is history for a long time now, 40, 40 or 50 years. Um, and I've, I was really struck, and I've done lots and lots of research on it, and I was really struck, I've been struck recently in the last year or so, going back to look at this, um, this history, and it was sort of became clear to me suddenly for the first time this shift that Marion has identified that we now, I mean generally in popular discourse, the percentage of women in parliament is taken as a sort of measure of women's um, democratic achievement and you know that's a sort of cliche now and we always note how many seats and what you know. And I thought, and then when, when I went back to read the early stuff, the stuff from 1900s on, I was really struck and it became sort of obvious that their emphasis was on the vote. Their emphasis, in other words, the 1902 Act enabled enfranchisement and also standing for parliament. There were those two things. And in contemporary, in our times, we tend to emphasise the standing for parliament but in their times, and of course, you know, this is what historians should do. We should attend to the past, as it were, what they were thinking. Um, and their emphasis was very much on the power of the ballot, the power of the vote. And thus, it was no surprise that the first two organisations in both Australia and the United States, they were organisations of voters. In Australia, the Australian Federation of Women Voters formed in 1927. And in the United States, the National League of Women Voters formed in 1920. It was voters, you know, they, they wanted to all, they wanted to mobilise women as voters to change society, to change policy, to inaugurate policies that were sympathetic, as they saw it, to women and children. And 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 so th there was uh, there was an enormous stress on the the potential power of the vote, on mobilising voters, on the, on the collectivity of voting. I mean, this was the other thing. It was a collective endeavour to try, and they were very conscious that they were creating this brand new world at the beginning of the 20th century and, and a new commonwealth, you know, that it was theirs, they were creating it, and their collective vote would make it this um, glorious welfare state in their terms. So the, st the so the, and, and actually the role of Vida Goldstein in these discussions is sort of crucial. She becomes a sort of icon because she stood for Parliament five times, federal Parliament five times. And in 1903, though she wasn't the only one then, but some people often say she was the only you know woman to nom uh, three women nominated um, in 1903. But the focus is on her, and indeed the electorate's named after her um, because her aspirations to become a federal politician seemed, seems now, you know, to proponents now to be emblematic of the aims of the women's movement. But that wasn't the case at the time. They were focused on what the collectivity of women's votes could do, what sort of welfare state they could produce. And you see, you know, you can find endless evidence to that effect. 
Hence, by the way, the focus on policy. You know, the, the, these early organisations, I gave you an example of Rose Scotts, had, you know, endless lists of aims of all of their policies they were to achieve. And they did achieve a lot of them um, as a collective force. I mean, primarily, as I said, getting women appointed to all those public offices as doctors and magistrates and lawyers and police. Um, and that's really interesting too. I mean, it's another question. Why did that happen? Why were they focused on that? I came to see quite recently, you know, as if I were blind, had been blind, um, that a lot of this early preoccupation, by the way, on the protection, the sheltering arms, was because of an issue that is current today still, the ubiquity of men's violence against women. The ubiquity of men's family violence, their violence against women and children in the 1890s, in the 1900s, was, was the, you know, this was at the forefront of these, of Rose Scott and Louisa Lawson and these women's minds. That was what was driving a lot of, which, and their policy, it's often in terms that seem coded in a way. Now, Marion's question is why did that change? And it certainly has changed. And, you know, and it's interesting, 1990s, um, I'm not sure it changed. It certainly it changed as the, as, the, as the nature of feminism, the feminist movement itself changed. Um, and that is, it, it changes in several ways. One thing that changes in the 1930s, which is crucial, is because of the Depression. The Depression saw attacks on women's right to work in paid employment. And that sort of saw a whole re reorientation in the women's movement away from the idea, the state socialism, that the state would pay mothers to look after their children. They, had to, they gave all that up and, and, and in fact, Miru Hegney co-founds the Council of Action for Equal Pay in 1937. That's a real turning point when they, they finally realise they've actually got to concentrate on getting women into the labour market. That's what that's the only way in which women will become economically independent. So that's one shift. And then by the 1940s and 50s, there's much more of a focus on equal pay. The first substantial group to win equal pay were the New South Wales teachers in 1958. That's interesting, them as a group, the teachers. Um, and then more and more, and by the time of the women's liberation movement in the 1970s, there's a complete focus on if you like, sort of equal opportunity, the opportunity to move into men's jobs um, and a complete rejection of what was then termed sex roles. You know, the, the sort of notion of the horror of sex roles um, was big in the 1970s. So there, there are lots of reasons and it's a really, really interesting shift in the women's movement itself um, until where we are today is sort of taken for granted. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sorry for taking so long. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, now, now a couple of questions perhaps for, for Tim, who um, has highlighted for us today the recommendation of the Kalmar Langton report that members of the Indigenous Voice not be directly elected by an enrolled Indigenous electorate. So in his presentation, uh, Tim made uh, a good case that voting does not have to be central to democratic uh, political institutions. And he clearly outlined for us some of the issues involved in creating an indigenous electoral role um, as a basis for voting for indigenous representative institutions. In, in doing that, uh, Tim drew on evidence from at ATSIC elections um, but perhaps he could also talk about the apparent success of the Maori electoral role in New Zealand. Um, and on the other side, the, the big problems involved in the Sami electoral role in, in Finland, where the UN Human Rights Committee uh, found the Finnish government had interfered in, in the principle of self-determination of indigenous people by improperly expanding the Sami role. So um, those two uh, sources of international evidence on issues around um, indigenous electoral roles would be interesting. And could Tim also address the objection raised to the voice that it will give indigenous Australians right, the right to participate in two kinds of representative institutions, 
or two sets of representative institutions, while non-Indigenous Australians can participate in only one set of representative institutions. Thank you. Mm. Well, thanks, Marion. Um, I, I have to say that I don't know anything about the drawing up of the Maori or Sami electoral rolls. Uh, so I can't, in that sense, I can't um, answer. <laughs> I can't answer your question, um, what, but what I can, I, I, and I mean, I think m while my ignorance is culpable, I would say that it's also a reflection of the fact that um, the the indigenous uh, thinking and writing about this that I've read um, t tends to make reference to uh, Australian uh, experience more than overseas experience. And of course, the exemplary Australian experience is the difficulties that uh, Tasmanian Aboriginal people have found in agreeing on who could vote for ATSIC elections. And um, the, in the 1990s. So the, in other words, one, there may be um, technologies or formula in other countries that can gu could guide Australia towards drawing up a, uh, an, an, indisput an indisputably bounded indigenous electoral role. But I doubt it, because my observation of uh, conversations amongst indigenous Australians is that they, there is quite a lot of dispute about the grounds upon which people can uh, publicly identify as, in, as, as indigenous. Uh, for instance, the indigenous sociologist uh, Bronwyn Carlson, in her uh, book um, published a few years ago, whose title escapes me just at the moment, uh, was very critical of the idea that the official Commonwealth definition of indigenous identity hands quite a lot of um, discretion to an indigenous community organisation to confirm a person's claim to be indigenous. There, are some, there is a, a strong strand of Indigenous opinion that disputes giving um, in, uh, Indigenous organisations that confirmatory role. And I think that the Kalma uh, Langton position has learned from this, this the, the disputed nature of indigen public indigeneity, if I can call it that, to look for a way that doesn't ha have to buy into uh, debates of that kind. Um, so that's, um, I mean, the other thing I would say about the Maori electoral role, of course, is that it did lead, it, it, it is associated with there being four Maori seats in the New Zealand parliament. So um, that there was no parallel to that in Australia's institutional uh, design. Now, on the second point that Marion raised, Indigenous Australians having more than one chance to vote for a representative, I, I think that people's thinking about whether that's a bad or a good thing is going to go back to their sense of what has happened in Australian history to weaken the position of Indigenous Australians in Australian society and political system. And whether that process of weakening them, which we call colonisation, is, is, is so great and so significant that it deserves an exceptional mechanism of redress. Now, I think that Australians are quite divided about whether they think Indigenous Australians deserve special treatment as the people who have been disadvantaged, to say the least, by colonisation, or whether that is all over and we're, we're all now standing on an equal playing field. I think people's views on that issue go very deep to their political worldview and their sense of what a liberal polity is. And I think it's quite going to be quite difficult to persuade someone who thinks that we all, all do now stand on a level playing field, that there is no legacy or heritage of colonisation to be redressed. It's going to be difficult to 
convince people who think that way to think otherwise. I th as I said, I think that the, there are fundamental differences amongst Australians about how we view the colonial history, uh, how we view Australia as a settler colonial society. I do think, though, that there's going to be great potential for a no campaign to raise the point that, um, that, that, um, that Marion has raised, that is, to, to, um, to say that the true application of the principle of liberty equality is to give no one special standing. I, th I fear a no, because I'm, I'm going to vote yes, so I fear the no campaign uh, making, uh, making use of that, um, of that ideal because I think it's a very potent one in the Australian electorate. Mm, okay. So, a quick question for, for, for Ben. Um, in his presentation today, Ben uh, linked women's suffrage with the secret ballot and the way the secret ballot changed elections from violent, violent and drunken affairs to um, civic, into civic rituals. So that change, turning elections into events more akin to a church service made it more difficult to argue that voting would expose women to danger. Why, nonetheless, did it take so long after the achievement of the secret ballot for women to gain the vote? The electoral process had already become unmanly, uh, in the words of the opponents of the secret ballot, but women were still not given access uh, to, to the vote. Mm. Thanks so much, uh, Marion. And uh, I almost feel you're more qualified to answer your, your own question. I thought, if I wanted to be cheeky, I would just pass it uh, back to you. But uh, look, I. I think the the most obvious answer, and of course there, there are lots of things that interlock there, but I think the most obvious answer is that for most people who you would call on the progressive, reformist, democratic side of thinking in the uh, in the late 19th century, or well, the mid, mid to late, were firstly uh, concerned with male suffrage and as I said with the Chartist movement it wasn't that they were unsympathetic towards women's votes but it was uh, quite a Machiavellian calculated decision that they thought this is more likely to get up but you're right that there's still you know that that was still largely done by sort of 1860 in most places and then that's still another 40 years and as far as I read the history I would say that it was another calculated decision that plural voting was a larger evil and was more of a concern for um, for democratic reformers. And there was a, pro probably a second time that sort of votes for women um, got bumped down, I suppose, in the order of things. And uh, well, Marilyn can probably correct me, but is it, is it about the 1880s really that it's um, in Australia that then women's votes sort of starts to become more of a, this sort of snowball effect. Yeah, although well, it was advocated from the 1850s, 1860s from the old things. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm. In any case, that's, that's my answer, Marion. Yes, that would be lovely. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to hand over to Jonathan now to, to, to manage the, the Q&A, which I hope will be lively. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much to... Sorry. I mean, I just really want to say something about um, the paper about the secret ballot. Is that possible? I mean, like to have a... Yeah, I Yes, please do. Because one of the things Possibly. in your discussion um, about the secret ballot and um, voting uh, that you didn't mention at all but I think is crucial is the issue of literacy. It, the secret ballot, as you said, it had two Australian distinctive features. One was that the government gave you a bit of paper on which names were written. You had to be literate to exercise the secret ballot. And then you took it in by yourself. This was another thing about the, the you know, going into the uh, confessional or something. And you went in by yourself. You weren't allowed to have others there to help you read it. And so the crucial... 
issue here, and Alan Atkinson's written about this as well, was literacy. And that vote, to, to exercise a secret ballot, this was a big issue both in Australia and the United States, you had to be literate. And, and to be literate, you, that, that went hand in hand with um, free compulsory secular education. I mean, education becoming compulsory in Victoria in 1872, um, because people had to be literate to exercise the secret ballot. And in the United States, it, was, it played out so that this progressive reform of the secret ballot became a major way of disenfranchising African Americans in the 1890s, because African Americans, by and large, couldn't read and write. And so it became quite common for quite right-wing people to advocate the secret ballot uh, because African Americans, and they were disenfranchised, you know, in their thousands. And this was also a concern in Australia, that the illiterate actually would be disenfranchised. And, and just on that, though, I think we really underestimate the importance of literacy, because the literacy was the key technology for the white Australia policy as well. You know, it was about literacy, it was about dictation, it was about being able to read and write that was the way, the technology they used to exclude. So, you know, it's a really important point. What do you think? Uh, it, yes, I, I, I think that's a, that's a really important point. And it's also why, I guess, uh, it's important to correct people who exaggerate that Australia invented secret voting. Because even in 1856, there was a technically secret voting election in New York. Yeah. But their version of secret voting was that people had, uh, the candidates had their own ballots and different colours. And that was a way of allowing um, people who might not be able to read. But it also completely undermined the whole point of secrecy. Because if you had been bribed or coerced, all you have to do is go up to the blue or the red one and sort of hold it as you go into the, um, and, and the secrecies uh, annulled. So uh, I think you're absolutely right that uh, it, it's a particular issue with the Australian version of secret uh, voting that uh, literacy becomes so important. It reminds me of a, uh, a lovely quote uh, from Frank Bongiorno's uh, book, uh, remark someone remarking at the time that in wonderment that uh, with the, the voting at the time of um, w women going into the voting area without a man to protect or guide their voting. It was remarkable um, that they managed to carry on. <laughs> Thank you so much for um, three fantastic presentations and three clever questions. Uh, it's now your turn, the audience. Um, we have a, a microphone over there and another one over there. And we also have a roving microphone that Alyssa has. So do we have any questions? And I was uh, just trying. We have one here and then over, up to at the back. Um, just on the Indigenous voting, I just wondered how it compared to other non-compulsory voting, because those figures look remarkably similar to the non-Indigenous votes when it comes to council elections in most Australian states and territories. Yes, that's true. And uh, you could add trade union voting for trade union elections. That's right. When voting isn't compulsory, Australians overwhelmingly don't vote. <laughs> That's true. And um, on the women getting the vote in the South Australian Parliament, I think for the first time, I think I did read somewhere once that it was because of an amendment moved by an opponent where they were just trying to push through votes for some women who were um, landed and literate and an opponent of the women's vote put up an amendment saying, no, I'm amending this to all women getting the vote knowing that nobody in their right mind would vote for such a lunatic proposition and to his shock and probably the supporters as well, it actually passed. So it's only a vague recollection I have of reading that, having read that many years ago. I was just wondering if you could comment on the veracity of it. Thank you. Was that aimed at you? Yeah, I mean, that's right. I had a question, Adam, up the back there. Um, Alyssa will scamper up, <laughs> being careful not to roll an ankle on these stairs. <laughs> Thanks. I'd like to take up the point about the links to the women's vote in major parties and how early on um, it seemed to be astute that they didn't want to affiliate with parties. Was that a factor in women not getting elected till indeed two well-identified party-affiliated women were elected in 1943. And the history since of women affiliated with or outside parties, and especially the 
emergence of the teals and what you see the future of the teals if they don't uh, link up with the party that they seem to have displaced. And especially the recent teals, not the member for Indai and Warringah who were sort of pre-teal and as I think have some particular characteristics that distinguish them from the recent teals. Um, and whoever or if all the panel would like to commentate on that and what it means for parties and pursuing quotas. It's a sort of a four part question there, I think. Yeah, it's a really um, good question about independent non-party candidates. And many noted, of course, um, that Zoe Daniel was voted in in the electorate of Goldstein and that seemed to have a nice historical coherence about it. Um, the one interesting difference between the independent non-party candidates back in Goldstein's day and with the Teals we, and one reason that might have helped, accounted for the greater success of the Teals than the independent non-party candidates back then um, is that the Teals weren't just women only policy. Their policy wasn't about women only. Um, as you know, they, their policy had the sort of three planks of integrity and climate as well as gender equity or whatever. So in other words, they could draw on and appeal to men in the electorate as well as women. So on the one hand, I, it is really interesting to notice everybody has the um, movement away from the major parties. It's a sort of cliche of our times. Um, on the other hand, that, that's also an interesting difference between those two sets of independent non-party candidates. Um, as to their future success, um, I don't know. Marion knows. <laughs> <laughs> Not really, but um, clear, clearly the, 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 the Teals were able to, to um, capitalise on that, those incredible levels of distrust in, in political parties which uh, are showing up in, in our uh, election surveys. Um, and they also were able to capitalise on new technologies, uh, able to do extensive uh, social media campaigns, um, not having to rely on, on um, expensive television advertising. Uh, so those were things. Um, the fact that they were able to raise so much money with the help of, of Climate 200, you know, was imp very important in enabling them to get name recognition, sufficient name recognition to, to get elected. I mean, there are a number of, of, of factors involved in, in the success of the, the, the Teals, um, but, uh, you know, a lot now will depend on, on their record in, in, in Parliament, perhaps, and, and so far, you know, so good <laughs> in terms of, uh, you know, what they're doing and, and the kind of media coverage that has been of it. So, um, you know, uh, it's, it's a very interesting, uh, I suppose, development, you know, on top of that tradition of distrust of party politics, which uh, Marilyn spoke about, um, in, particularly in, in the, in the pre-war era. Um, so we have very competent women candidates able to capitalise on the distrust of, of party politics, which is right across the um, electorate now. Um, and, uh, and 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 take that and take that forward with, with a new model of, of community organising, with that kind of kitchen table organising model, and so on, to 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 um, uh, build up re-engagement with politics um, amongst voters in, in in those 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 key um, in a metropolitan electorates. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to stop there <laughs> before I dig myself <laughs> into <laughs> a hole. Um, I think at the end of this term of Parliament, it's going to be uh, interesting, and, and this would be a great project for a political science student, would be to trace the voting pattern of all the Teal candidates and to test the proposition that they are a quasi-party 
that is, to what extent do they vote the same way on the big issues that have run through the first Albanese government? In saying that, I'm not um, in any way giving uh, oxygen to the idea that if they're a quasi-party, that's a bad thing. Uh, personally, I don't care one way or the other. I just want to see uh, good government. <laughs> Anything to add to that, Ben? Or... Uh, well, I'd maybe just comment uh, very quickly about uh, Goldstein herself. Um, it's an interesting counterfactual if she'd had the support of a party mechanism, but she also was running at a pretty difficult time to be an independent. It was still the period of sort of the three 11s, and I, I think most voters do ultimately go to the booth thinking what type of government, what sort of policies are going to be best uh, for me personally. And th this was the second, if for women in uh, Western Australia and South Australia, this was the second time they had voted in a federal election. So there may have been a sense, well, you know, Goldstein's already got uh, her main objective and um, when I'm alone uh, in the sacred confessional, I'm, I'm thinking more about, uh, you know, the economy, the direction uh, and which of these sort of three emerging forces uh, I most ideologically align with. Can I just say one, just one thing quickly in relation to what Tim just said. It is really interesting about how the Teals have voted and whether they're a party and what cohesion. You might or might not have seen the ACTU recently put out a report on how each of the Teals voted on the industrial relations legislation recently passed. And there was quite a distinct division, as we knew there would be. A lot of people attribute this to state politics. You know, the Victorians are all left wing <laughs> in Dan's progressive state. And in New South Wales, they're all pro-business. And indeed, the voting on the industrial legislation showed that Monique Ryan and Zoe Daniel supported it, and some of the you know, people in Sydney didn't. So there was a distinct division, and that, it, I mean, I, I agree with you, that's going to be very, very interesting to see how they vote on those mm. things, yeah. Mm. Uh, yes. One just up the front here. Uh, Alyssa's en route. Um, I was wondering if any of the panellists could tell us a bit more about the, um, the disqualification of coloured races in the Franchise Act and the effects that that might have had on the, um, the Chinese and Japanese and other kind of communities who were in Australia at the time. Actually, one small thing I'd like, I'd like to say on that, because I've done quite a bit of work on the history of Chinese-Australian relations, political relations. Um, and and it's extremely interesting. Um, Chinese Australians in Victoria, you know, post gold rushes in Victoria, large population in the 1870s and 1880s were very active politically. And so, I mean, the common stereotype of, you know, racism and Chinese and the octopus and all that stuff is far less interesting than actually reading all of the stuff that Chinese Australians wrote, you know, their books, the booklets, the pamphlets, the petitions. Um, in which they demanded what they called common human rights. I mean, there's a very interesting history of human rights in Australia, voiced by Chinese Australians. Um, and it's also very interesting, a lot of people don't realise, is that manhood suffrage in the 1850s, um, in Victoria anyway, and I think New South Wales, South Australia, so it, I mean, manhood was everything. And I think we should remember this. Manhood, they were proud of manhood, and so manhood trumped status or title or, you know, aristocracy or whatever. And it also, for a moment, trumped race. Manhood suffrage extended to Aboriginal men and to Chinese men in Victoria. Which is why, in Victoria, they needed special legislation in 1881 that specifically disenfranchised Chinese Australian men. Others might. Can I ask a follow-up on that? Um, and it could go to any of you, I suppose. But um, you said the the, um, the Chinese communities were making those arguments. What, if any, traction did those arguments find in the in the white community or the? Well, what I think is really interesting and hasn't generally been done in Australian political history is to look at the, the Chinese Australian communities. I mean, the communities where they had about 40, 50 very articulate um, 
spokesmen, mainly men, who are bilingual, trilingual, um, as I said, writing these booklets, making these arguments, that, 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 they're, that there's a dialogue going on, to go to your question, and a very interesting dialogue between the radical nationalists, the progressives, um, like Higgins and Deacon and Pearson, on the one hand, who were becoming more and more nationalist and racist in their nationalism, um, and the Chinese arguments for common human rights and what they called cosmopolitan friendship and sympathy, which is another wonderful phrase. They ask for a nation based on cosmopolitan friendship and sympathy, you know, some sort of anticipation of what we might call multiculturalism. And these arguments in dialogue got sort of fiercer and fiercer. Each um, prodded the others on. If, and I don't think you can understand either the fierce um, advocacy for a nationalist racist self-determination um, on the part of Higgins and co, and um, Chinese arguments for cosmopolitanism and common human rights. The two, the, they speak to each other, and you can see them speaking to each other because they refer to each other's arguments. I've got a, uh, another one, exercising presenters, uh, sorry, uh, Chair's rights, as it were. Um, this one might be for Ben, but um, I think in the, uh, it, I think it was in your your um, presentation you were talking about um, that that first 1902, 1903 election. Can you talk a bit about some of the uh, kind of the, the challenges that must have gone into running a national election in in a country that. Um, had none of the, the kind of the, the communications and transport that we, we take for granted. Running a modern election is a significant uh, logistical and communications exercise. How did they do it then? It, you, you mentioned, I think, uh, the uh, electoral role, but there was also the, the business of the ballots and the voting and the counting and the... Uh, sure. Well, really, the 1901 election was the, the big... Uh, experiment of, of how can it be done with the technology of the day and I'd um, uh, recommend um, uh, another wonderful uh, Marion. Uh, Marion Sims has a great uh, uh, chapter um, in a book called Elections Matter on, on how the uh, machinery of government I suppose was uh, uh, put, in, uh, put into place but uh, it well, I'll just say it, it, it went remarkably uh, smoothly, and I suppose all the doomsday sayers, uh, particularly about this being the first one uh, with women voters, um, it, it, there was a lot of gloating in the progressive press about uh, sort of I told you so stuff. So, it, uh, yeah, from a uh, machinery of government point of view, it went uh, really smoothly. Of course, it wasn't the first time that Australians had voted um, in elections, so it was wasn't coming out of nowhere. Any other comments on, on that one? Well, I mean, one of the precious objects of, of the Australian Electoral Commission is the, the half moon ballot box. You know, this is the, the ballot box uh, designed to be carried on horseback <laughs> to remote <laughs> polling stations. So that's part of our political history as well. <laughs> I should add, though, of course, this is before compulsory voting, so it wasn't as um, outrageously difficult uh, as it would have been if it was compulsory. Yeah. It's, um, it's never easy to see past the lights uh, in this room. So, um, yes, we have one up here. Thank you. Um, Marilyn, in your talk, you mentioned that um, as part of the suffrage movement that there was a push to sort of have more women in other careers. You mentioned being doctors, police, mm -hmm. nurses. But you noted that there wasn't such a push for women to become politicians. Would you mind speaking a little bit more about why that wasn't seen in that same sort of, you know, career for women? Sure. Thank you. Sure. I'm glad you asked the question. Um, because um, we now today assume the, uh, our discourse about these things is in terms of women's right to careers, equal opportunity, that women should be allowed to become anything. Interestingly, when all of these women's organisations across Australia pushed for the appointment of women as magistrates, jail wardens, doctors, lawyers, particularly police, which who were mostly appointed across the states during World War One. 
um, they didn't they didn't make any argument about the fact these jobs should be open to women. Their point was they didn't want vulnerable women falling into men's hands. And so any job, any any area of public life in which women might fall into men's hands, as with jail warders or doctors or magistrates or whatever, the police, you know, who are always harassing prostitutes and things, you know, those, those jobs should be filled by women. I mean, you know, so it was a completely different sort of argument. They didn't talk much, I, I don't think, about, you know, the rights and wrongs of women becoming politicians. A lot of women stood, a lot of women stood as independent woman candidates. It wasn't just Goldstein, a lot of women across um, Australia. Um, but it wasn't a priority because in a way, careers, in the sense we think of careers, weren't a priority. It was about reform. It was reforming society. And as I say, if you go back and read all of this quite closely, you will see that there's a real terror about um, men's violence against women and children. If you look at their writing, it's, you know, what to do about that. And that question, what to do about men, the ubiquity of men's violence, of course, is still a question today. There are institutes founded to resolve this public policy. So there's a real continuity there. But yes, it's a good question you ask because yes, it wasn't about women being allowed into these jobs as a right. It was about them making sure vulnerable women in a vulnerable position wouldn't fall into men's hands. Yeah. We might have time for one last question. Uh, if not, Jonathan, if, yes, could yes. I just add uh, something to, to um, my se answer to Marion's second question, which is about the argument of equality. And I, I don't know if anybody here is <coughs> listening to Noel Pearson's Boyer lectures, but I urge you to listen to them, and in particular, the third lecture, because it seems to me Noel Pearson is doing something very interesting in that lecture. He's actually shifting the categorization of those who are most in need of a voice from indigenous people to what he calls the bottom one million. So mm. in other words, his, his, his social policy is increasingly predicated on categories of class mm. rather than of ethnicity or indigeneity. So I suppose one of the the weaknesses, uh, one of the weaknesses of the, the case for the voice is that it nominates the entire indigenous section of the Australian population as being equally the victims of colonisation, when it's clear that some indigenous people are doing pretty well. And it ignores uh, non-Aboriginal people, non-indigenous people, who are not the victims of colonisation, they're the victims of capitalism. And that they also need political redress. So although I'm going to, as I said, going to vote yes, I do so with a certain ambivalence about whether in Australia our political language is correctly nominating those who are most in need of social justice. And I am uh, uh, uneasily aware that uh, the, the argument for social justice needs to be made in class terms, not in terms of ethnicity. An interesting um, thought to finish on. Um, thank you all to, um, uh, for coming along today, uh, including those who may be with us uh, online, silently watching. <laughs> um, it's been a really, really interesting discussion. Uh, with the leave of the, with the permission of the speakers, I hope to put together um, all of their talks into uh, a library publication which will come out um, reasonably soon. But uh, thank you, obviously, to our, um, our four participants. It's been fantastic, and thanks for making the time to join us. Uh, I hope you've all enjoyed it as much as I have. I've got about 200 questions I could have asked had I had all afternoon. Please join me in thanking our um, panel. <laughs>